welcome to Solar Alberta's 2023 Solar Series. Today's webinar, the first in our series of the year, is called Transforming Energy, the Impacts of Solar on Alberta's Grid. My name is Heather McKenzie and I am the Executive Director for Solar Alberta. I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge that I'm hosting you today from Amiskwachee Waskahegan, also known as Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and the homelands of the Métis Nation. Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place and home of many Indigenous peoples, including the Papas Chase, Nehewak or Cree, Soto, Dene, Blackfoot and Nakoda Sioux, nations whose ancestors have cared for and nurtured these lands since time immemorial. We were delighted to have so many people register for this event. I think there were 300 registrations when I last checked, which is amazing. Please note that we are recording this webinar for future distribution. Today, we will be hearing from two informative speakers about decentralized energy, which includes solar energy and how it is typically connected to the grid. Then we will dive into the impacts of solar on Alberta's distribution and transmission infrastructure, as well as how solar impacts the electricity rates paid by all Albertans. Following the presentation, there will be a Q&A period in which you can all participate. The formal Q&A will run until about a quarter past the hour, and then we will be inviting you to join us for an additional 15 minutes in a more relaxed Zoom meeting Q&A at the end. The link for the extended Q&A will be posted in the chat at the end of the formal Q&A, and I will draw your attention to it at that time. So please make sure to click on the link before leaving the webinar. The entire session will wrap up in an hour and a half. In an effort to increase accessibility to the content we are offering, we have enabled closed captioning for this presentation. You can turn the captioning on in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. During our formal Q&A period, we will be using Zoom Q&A for questions rather than the chat box. So please enter your questions in the Q&A section. Also, please click on the little thumbs up symbol to upvote questions that you like. Before we move forward, we're going to do a quick poll to get a sense of who we have joining us today. So please take a minute to answer the question popping up on your screen now. There we go. I'll uh, leave that open as folks start to reply, get a little bit of a sense for who's here. While some of you are still doing the poll, I encourage you to also take a minute pop your name, land acknowledgement, and any contact info that you're comfortable sharing in the chat now and throughout the event so that others can look you up on LinkedIn or email you and hopefully some relationships can begin to be formed. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much for participating. It is helpful to know a little about the audience. So I'm just gonna ask Haley if you could please end the poll and share the results with everybody, it'd be great. Quite a few solar curious folks here. Industry professionals, I'm not surprised since uh, this is uh, one of those few very cold days where some of you might be in the office instead of on the roofs. <laughs> and looks like we've got lots of folks registered for the solar show already. Um, we'll be chatting more about that in our intro. And welcome to our students as well. Well, thanks very much. I think we will close out of that for now. And I'm going to share a little bit about Solar Alberta for anyone who's new to us. We are actually in our 32nd year of operation. Solar Alberta is a not for profit society that is dedicated to accelerating Alberta's transition to a just and sustainable energy future. We do so by advocating, by educating, and by serving as an industry and community hub for solar energy. Our membership is made up of over 360 individuals and businesses. To keep up to date on all our activities, please sign up for our newsletter at solaralberta.ca. We provide a number of services, including managing a solar directory through our website. In this way, we act as a bridge for installers, suppliers, and other solar related businesses to connect with their customers and clients. You can see a screenshot of the directory here on the slide and a link to it in the chat. In addition to our website services, we run a number of educational programs, such as this solar seminar series and a number of in person and online networking events each year over the lunch hour. 
Our next online networking event is for women and non-binary folks working on or interested in working in the solar sector and related fields. We're hosting this on March 8th over the lunch hour to celebrate International Women's Day. And we'll be hearing from Pambanas Banu Jekumar about her experience at COP27 prior to our networking component. So the registration link for that's being popped in the chat now. Also, as mentioned previously, we're hosting our annual online conference and trade show next week, February 6th through 10th. You can register for the solar show now if you'd like. Uh, we're really excited to be offering sessions about community generation, electric vehicles, building equity in the solar sector, embodied carbon and more. Virtual trade show booths are also still available and can be purchased for only $125 through the link in the chat as well. Recordings of our 2021 and 2022 solar show sessions can be found on our Solar Alberta YouTube channel, along with many of these wonderful seminars. This spring, we're once again hosting a number of live online courses at very affordable rates for solar industry professionals or those transitioning into the sector. Classes are on Tuesday and Thursday evenings. If you're unable to attend the live classes this spring, you can alternatively purchase pre-recorded courses and workshops on our website. And if you're not already, I encourage you to join Solar Alberta as a member. We are constantly evolving our member service offerings, some of which you can see listed on the screen. Individual membership is $35 and can be purchased in the link in the chat. On April 5th, we're gonna be hosting our annual general meeting. And so I wanna invite you all to sign up as members, attend and elect your new board. There are at least three vacancies to fill on the board this year. So if you're interested in, in applying to serve on the board, you can do so through our website until February 26th. If you can't quite commit to board work, but you are looking to support the work that we're doing, please consider volunteering or donating. The link to be a general volunteer is being popped in the chat now as well as links to our current 5050 and crowdfunding page. There's only about a week left to participate in the 5050 and to see your donation matched through our crowdfunding page. And lastly, we're pleased to have just launched our inaugural lifetime membership award nomination process. To nominate someone for a lifetime membership with Solar Alberta, please click on the final link in the chat. Without further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity to give a shout out and welcome to Fortis, our sponsor for today. Uh, we really appreciate that, that they're helping us make this content free to the public. Also want to thank Epcor for sponsoring the seminar series as a whole this year. Uh, we couldn't offer these amazing free, this amazing free content without the support of our sponsors. Um, of course, we, if you're interested in sponsoring as well, your company can get in touch with us. We do have one solar show sponsorship remaining for the building equity in the solar sector session. Now I'm going to turn the mic over to our sponsor, Rob Deschamps with Fortis Alberta. He's going to introduce himself, tell us a little bit about Fortis, and then he'll introduce our two thought provoking speakers for the day. Welcome, Rob. I'm just going to turn off my screen share so that you pop up in a big way on the screen here with me. Sure, sounds good. Thanks. Thanks very much, Heather. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rob Deschamps, and I'm the manager of Key Accounts at Fortis Alberta. Uh, Fortis Alberta owns and operates more than 60% of Alberta's total electricity distribution network, focusing on delivering safe and reliable electricity to more than half a million residential farm and business customers. We serve over 240 communities with 127,000 kilometers of distribution power lines across Alberta. As more companies seek to connect distributive energy resources or DERs to the grid every year, Fortis Alberta's responsibility lies in connecting these DERs to the distribution system. To paint a picture for you, in 2021, we implemented nine distributive generation connections. And in 2022, we connected more than double that at 19. Uh, currently, we have 39 active projects planned, 20 of which will connect in 2023 totaling 276 megawatts of additions. Similarly for Microgen, in 2021, we had 441 connections, and in 2022, that was over 700. All this is to say we are happy to be here at the Solar Alberta Show, learning from other industry experts and working together to build reliable, sustainable future for our province. Um, that's why Fortis Alberta is proud to be a sponsor of today's seminar, Transforming Energy, the Impacts of Solar on Alberta's Grid. 
and I'm personally looking forward to hearing from today's speakers. Please join me in welcoming Alicia Kruto from Innovate Calgary and Tim Weiss from the University of Alberta. Um, I'll just go uh, do a quick bio on our two uh, speakers here. Uh, Alicia Kuto is the Ventures Manager of Energy and Clean Tech at Innovate Calgary's Energy Transition Center and is an advocate of renewable energy and energy efficiency in Canada. She is a sessional instructor at Lakeland College's Sustainable Energy Technology Program where she teaches energy efficiency and sustainability in the built environment. She is also co-owner of Koto Consulting and Engineering. Alicia has a background in renewable energy and holds a Master of Sustainable Sustainability and Energy Security from the University of Saskatchewan. Her mission is to contribute to Canada's energy transition to net zero. Uh, Tim Weiss uh, has been an industry industrial professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Alberta since 2017. Prior to joining the University of Alberta, he spent over 15 years working in the interactions in technology, policy, and business for renewable energy, including working for the Pembina Institute, the Canadian Wind Energy Association, and an advisor to Alberta's Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Tim teaches courses in thermodynamics and energy systems and has a team of graduate students focusing on the changing roles for renewable energy energy storage and vehicle electrification in Alberta. I'll now be passing the mic over to Alicia. Awesome, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Rob. Uh, so I'm just gonna share my screen here. And I was having some issues with this this morning, so my apologies in advance if this takes a moment <laughs> to get set up here. Um, okay. Perfect. Now I don't want to share my whole screen. So Heather or Haley, can you please let me know what you see on your screen? Because I'm working off a laptop today. We are seeing the whole screen still, but I know okay. at one point you did have just the press. There we go. Beautiful. Yes. Okay. Well, then I'm going to have to read off of my notes here because I can't see otherwise. So that's just fine. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. In the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge that I am joining here today from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Ganai, Pekani, the Sutina Nation, the Iaxi Nakoda Nations, and the Métis Nation Region 3. As Rob mentioned, uh, my name is Alicia Couteau, and I, among many other things, uh, am the Venture Manager of Energy and Clean Tech at Innovate Calgary. Part of my role is to identify and help accelerate clean tech and energy startups that will be instrumental in transforming the face of the energy sector in Canada. So my personal mission is to educate and advocate our clean energy transition. And I'm really passionate about facilitating conversations among stakeholders throughout this ecosystem. So huge thank you to Heather um, and Solar Alberta for asking me to participate in today's seminar series. So our home office at Innovate Calgary is the Energy Transition Center, which is located in the Ampersand Building in downtown Calgary. The ETC opened in November of 2022, and it isn't just a space, it's a collision of ideas that support the energy transition. Along with our partners, this one-of-a-kind initiative nurtures emerging startups and their founders by de-risking energy transition technologies in collaboration with an industry, academic students, researchers, and users, and the community. A few notable startups that are currently in this space are Geogen, a geothermal technology company that uses reclaimed oil wells to produce electricity, Solar Steam, a concentrated solar generator technology that works alongside a customer's existing boilers to provide supplementary renewable heat for use in cold climates, and Ayrton Energy, a hydrogen-powered off-grid energy generation and storage solution. So if you are a clean tech or energy startup company looking to find a home base, um, we'll be happy to host you here at the Energy Transition Center. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, you can reach out to me through email or find me on LinkedIn, and I will provide those details uh, at the end of the presentation. And I have also um, put my email already into the chat. 
Uh, and so for the last item, my shameless plug, we've recently launched Tech Tuesdays, a monthly speaker series that aims to change the paradigm of university industry engagement and programming and ecosystem development. So if you are in the Calgary area, please join us here in person on the last Tuesday of every month. Uh, our next session is scheduled for February 28th, and we will be hosting Mike Procy from TC Energy. Okay, so now on uh, to what you're actually here for. <laughs> so as we begin this journey of the energy transition, let's just start with the basics and define the difference between power and energy. So power and energy are related, but they are different concepts. Think of power like the speedometer in your car. It tells you how fast something is happening. Energy, on the other hand, is like the amount of gas that's in the car's tank. It tells you how much of something there is. So power is a measure of how much work is being done over a certain amount of time. So for example, a hundred watt light bulb uses a hundred watts of power. Energy is a measure of the amount of work that can be done. So for example, a battery has a certain amount of energy stored in it. So the energy can be used to power a light bulb for a certain amount of time, or it can be used to power a motor for a certain amount of time. So in simple terms, power is how much you have at a moment and energy is how much you have in total. So let's talk about uh, the makeup of the electrical grid here in Alberta. So there are two different kinds of power lines uh, for the transportation of electricity, transmission lines and distribution lines. So while transmission and distribution lines do work together to carry and deliver electricity from power sources to consumers, they do serve different functions. And there are a key number of differences between transmission and distribution lines. So what is the difference between transmission and distribution power lines? The core difference between transmission and distribution power lines is that transmission power lines are for long distance, high voltage uh, electricity transportation, whereas distribution power lines are for shorter distances and lower voltage electricity transportation. Um, so just kind of illustrate that transmission lines are the power lines you typically see on the side of the highway, while distribution lines are usually the ones that you see on the sides of our streets and inside our cities and towns. Transmission power lines carry bulk electricity from the generating power station to a number of substations, and the key function and features of transmission power lines are to carry electricity over long distances, to transport bulk electricity at higher voltages, typically between 60 kV and 500 kV, uh, usually are supported by tall metal towers. They're bi-directional, meaning they allow electricity to travel in both directions. They use a three-phase supply system and transmission lines are typically thicker compared to distribution lines. Uh, distribution power lines, on the other hand, carry electricity from substations to consumers completing the electricity journey. So the key functions and features of distribution power lines are they carry electricity through uh, shorter distances to neighbors and communities. They're usually supported by wooden poles at lower heights than the metal towers of the transition lines. And they're traditionally monodirectional uh, and made to only carry electricity into one direction. They use single phase sub, uh, energy supplies and distribution lines are thinner than transmission lines. So these serve as the final stage in delivery of electricity to homes and businesses. Um, and although distribution lines carry lower voltage electricity, they're still powerful enough to cause injury or death. So safety moment, if you ever see a down power line, do not go near it. <laughs> so throughout Alberta, there are over 26,000 kilometers of transmission lines that bring power to over 4 million people. And with today's sponsor, Fortis owns and operates over 12,000 kilometers of those transmission lines, which make up nearly half of the bulk of Alberta's high voltage electricity system infrastructure. The Alberta Electric System Operator, or ASO's job, is to work with transmission facility owners, generators, and retailers to ensure there's enough power to keep the system going so that when we turn the lights on, electricity will be there. To ensure this is possible, the ASO plans the transmission system to ensure the power is transported from where it's created to where it's needed 24-7. Planning is key to reliable electricity, and in Alberta, it starts with the ASO. So by forecasting uh, use and future demand, they use this information to test the system and to determine possible solutions for new infrastructure. This information is captured and made public in their long-term transmission plan and their long-term outlook, which are both published every two years. Based on the projects identified in the long-term plan, the ASO prioritizes projects and then applies additional scrutiny and testing before initiating a new transmission project. 
Once they're satisfied, they must apply to the Alberta Utilities Commission or AUC to review that need. If the need is approved, then the transmission facilities owners determine the most appropriate route and location for the infrastructure and must obtain uh, facilities approval from the Alberta Utilities Commission, also known as the AUC. So the AUC is a quasi-judicial body, meaning it has the same powers of the court of law, but instead of judges, the, AUC, the AUC has commissioners who are experts in utility regulations. They act in the public interest by balancing the needs of both customers and utilities while taking into consideration the economic, social, and environmental impacts of the application and carefully weighing out all materials submitted during the proceedings. So as previously noted, the AUC must approve construction and costs of new transmission projects and also regulates and sets the prices charged to deliver electricity over the transmission lines. So the distribution lines in the province are owned and operated by a mixture of investor-owned utilities, municipalities, and rural electrification associations. Um, so as Rob mentioned at the... Um, the top of the hour, Fortis does own 60% uh, of the distribution lines here in Alberta. So similar to transmission regulation, both the construction of new distribution facilities, along with the prices charged for distribution, uh, are regulated and set out by the Alberta Utilities Commission. So this is where, in my opinion, we will see the bulk of the transformation happening in the province in the coming years. And so as it relates to new generation, the AUC must approve the construction of new projects. However, it does not regulate the wholesale prices charge, um, charge for the electrical outputs, as in Alberta, this is determined by the market. So under the Electric Utilities Act, the microgeneration regulation allows Albertans to meet their own electricity needs by generating um, electricity from renewable or alternative energy sources. So micro generators producing excess electricity receive credits for what they feed into the grid. This is the regulation that governs um, if you're looking to add solar to your home or to your business. It should be noted, however, that there are limitations to the sizing requirements of your system, and you are limited to sizing a micro generation unit based on the site's historical consumption, meaning you cannot generate more power than what is used from the previous year. You can only generate enough to offset the amount used. So, however, in the summer months, you can typically generate more energy than is being used in a home. So those credits then bank onto your bill so that in the winter months, when there's less sunlight, you can pull those credits out, balancing out the system production and usage over a 12-month period. So there's two categories of microgenerators. There's small microgenerators under 150 kilowatts who are credited for the electricity that are sent back to the grid on a monthly basis at retail rates. But they may also install a suitable meter to receive credit for excess electricity based on hourly wholesale market prices. Typically, you would sign a contract uh, with your electricity retailer and agree have it agreed upon price. And then there's large micro generators that are sized over 150 kilowatts who are credited for the electricity sent back to the grid at hourly wholesale market prices. And the local wire service provider is also called the distribution company is responsible for connecting a micro generator system. Individual micro generators do not have to pay for the ordinary and reasonable cost of interconnection and meter infrastructures as these costs are all shared by the customers in a distribution company service area. The customers electricity retailer must manage the administration and billing of the excess energy sent to the grid. This is monitored by the AUC to ensure costs passed on to customers are fair. In 2016, the regulation was amended to increase the size limit of a microgeneration system from one to five megawatts and allowing uh, microgeneration systems to serve adjacent sites. And uh, other changes help to improve the reliability, stability, and safety of microgeneration and the distribution grid here in Alberta. So microgeneration customers are also required to sign an interconnection agreement with the distribution company, and the distribution company owns the distribution system for home, farm, business, and industry. The distribution system carries electricity from the provincial transmission lines to customers, and the distribution company reviews and approves microgeneration applications, installs meters, and provides metering data uh, to retailers and to the Alberta Electric System Operator, or the ASO. So Alberta has a little bit more of a complicated electricity market in comparison to other regions um, in our country. And electricity markets vary from province to province and territory. 
So in some provinces, the model is a traditional vertically integrated structure, a large monopoly which provides bundled electricity services, which are regulated in relation to the operation as a public utility. They have an obligation to provide a non-discriminatory service on cost of service basis. Alberta and Ontario have deregulated energy markets. This type of energy market seeks to prevent energy monopolies by creating competition. The structure allows energy users to choose from multiple energy providers based on rates that suit their needs. Regulated energy markets are those with vertically integrated utilities. So a vertically integrated utility is one that owns, controls, generation, transmission, distribution components of an electricity network. So various provincial electric utilities or crown corporations that are wholly owned by provincial organizations that are structured like private companies. Provinces and territories with vertically integrated utilities use their ownership interests in their crown corporation to advance their region's energy objectives. So the electricity markets in these areas also have small co um, competitive sectors at both retail and wholesale levels. The so deregulated market, which is what we have here in Alberta, is a competitive energy market that allows for competition and allows consumers to choose electricity plans that meet their specific needs. So deregulated markets permit participants to invest in power plants and transmission lines. Generation owners sell their wholesale electricity to resale suppliers, who then set the prices for consumers. Consumers then benefit from retail rates by allowing them to compare and choose different contract structures and there also tends to be an increased availability of renewable energy sources and green pricing programs. So in short, what this means here in Alberta, we have the power to choose between regulated rate companies and competitive rate companies uh, to be our electricity providers. So based on where you live, uh, there are many different options. I think I read a stat somewhere that there was over 200 um, electricity retailers that have been registered um, here in Alberta. So we have quite a bit of choice. Customers who do not sign a contract for electricity are served by a regulated retailer. And the regulated retailers are reviewed and approved by the AUC or the Alberta Utilities Commission and can change from month to month. You can choose to purchase your electricity from a variety of licensed competitive retailers and may enter into a contract for a type and length of energy service that you want. It's important to note that the AUC does not approve the prices for competitive retailers as these prices are subjected to change um, by the forces of other retailers. So there's two main charges on an electricity bill. So the cost of energy consumed versus the cost of energy or the delivering of the energy. So these charges are broken down into four main components. We have an energy charge, that is the fee for the amount of energy you've used during a billing period, and it's calculated via um, price per kilowatt hour. So the energy charge does not include your delivery costs or other fees such as administration fees. And this is how much you pay per kilowatt hour for the electricity that you've used. It's usually listed in cents per kilowatt hour on your, um, on your bills, and that's the standard unit of energy that's used by energy retailers to measure the electricity delivered to consumers. So one kilowatt hour means the energy consumption of a thousand watts for one hour. So for example, a 250 watt laptop will use one kilowatt hour after being on for four hours. Um, there's administration charges or admin fees, and this is what your electricity provider charges you to cover the cost of billing and customer service. So this charge is fixed and remains the same for each billing cycle um, or previous from month to month. Distribution charges are the fee for covering the cost that a distribution company incurs for bringing electricity from the transmission system to your home. So this fee covers the cost of building, maintenance, and operation of their distribution systems. There's also transmission charges, and these help recover the cost of transporting electricity generated from the transmission grid over to the distribution grid. Typically, this charge is based on your energy consumption for a billing period. And for larger consumers of electricity, the transmission charge will be based on both energy consumption and the required demand level load. Um, so two great ways of saving on your, on your electricity bill um, are by going solar and installing air source heat pumps. There's also two ways in which solar credits um, can be applied to your electricity bill through net metering and through net billing. So although the two concepts are similar, they can result in markedly different costs at the end of each billing cycle. 
So with net metering, you receive bill credits, but it's not usually a monetary exchange. Rather, the credits you gain from your net metering are banked and used when you need to pull out electricity from the grid on a cloudy day. So like I had previously mentioned, you might bank a bunch of credits in the summertime and um, have them on your bill. So, you know, November, December, January, um, when we don't have as much sun, you're able to um, use those banked credits. So net metering credits can be rolled over from month to month and are normally a one-to-one -one exchange for a kilowatt hour produced by a solar array and is worth the same as a one-to-one -one kilowatt hour that's produced from the grid. This simplifies your energy bill as you're only billed for your net energy use or your energy consumption, less your energy production. Net metering programs, on the other hand, are a great way for solar owners to store energy produced by their solar systems. Um, the one-to-one -one model of net metering makes home solar systems more valuable. However, utility companies argue that because retail prices reflect business expenses, in addition to the value of electricity, net metering credits are equal to more than the value of electricity and delivery. So with net billing, instead of banking the credits earned from the excess energy generated by the solar system, net billing programs enable you to sell your electricity to the utility. So net billing is a monetary exchange in which energy generated by your home is traded like that of a large scale solar project. However, with net billing, your compensation rate may be lower than with net metering. However, in Alberta, we do have some excellent options um, for solar clubs. So Alberta, Manitoba and Yukon are the only three regions in Canada that offer net billing and everywhere else offers net metering. So now that we've laid the groundwork of how the electricity system operates here in Alberta, let's talk about some of the modalities that we'll see um, that are going to come and transform the grid or are transforming our grid. So until quite recently, electricity has been mostly generated at larger power plants far from urban centers and transmitted over long distances, giving most electricity customers very little choice about what source of electricity they use. Um, while large power plants will continue to play an essential role in Alberta's electricity system, new smaller scale technologies like solar panels and on-site battery storage, um, and of course wind, will enable communities to produce and distribute their own electricity, reducing their reliance on the provincial electricity system. Decentralized energy is defined as kinetic and or potential energy, which is either thermal, radiant, chemical, nuclear, or electrical that is created or stored close to the point of consumption. It encompasses on-site energy generation, energy storage, and can also include energy efficiency measures. Decentralized energy projects vary in size and there's no set maximum capacity because systems are designed to meet the needs of local loads. So these modalities are known as distributed energy resources or DERs or DERs, <laughs> and they can transform the way communities meet their energy needs. So microgrids, mini-grids, and nanogrids are also localized clusters of decentralized energy systems. And microgrids can operate connected to the distribution system, um, but they're often also designed to be able to disconnect or go into island mode. So when grid outages occur. So mini-grids and nanogrids are also fully autonomous with no grid connection. Interoperability is critical for microgrids, mini-grids, and nanogrids, and they must be designed to be responsive, dynamic, and automated. So we'll see more of this coming with smart grids and smart grid technology. Uh, so however, for the purposes of today's presentation and context, uh, we're going to focus on what I think are the two main contributors as it relates to the impact of Alberta's grid, uh, which is using solar PV and battery storage. So it's important to note there's also a difference um, between projects that are behind the meter and in front of the meter projects. So the difference between a behind the meter or BTM and a front of a meter system comes from an energy system's position in relation to the electric meter. So a BTM system provides power that can be used on site without passing through a mirror, uh, pardon me, a meter, while a front of the meter system provides power to offsite locations. So kind of a good way to think about this is behind the meters typically are residential um, solar systems, whereas front of the meter are more large scale systems. So um, I've got some examples of this that might kind of help make it a little bit more clear. <laughs> So on-site generation, so any energy generation that's on a prop property is considered a behind the meter. So this includes home solar panels, small wind turbines, and even gas-powered generators. 
All these technologies generate electricity so that you can use them on the premises. So in the case of wind and solar, excess generation can be sent through your meter and to the grid for a credit on your electricity bill, which we discussed can either be done through net billing or net metering um, and depending on the market. So here in Alberta, we do have net billing. Um, and then on-site energy storage uh, systems on your property are also a behind the meter system. So electricity stored in a home battery, for example, goes directly from the battery to your home and appliances without having to pass through an electric meter. So in contrast, um, utility scale generation, so just about all of our large scale solar generation facilities that feed into the power grid are positioned as in front of the meter. So this includes most fossil fuel generation like coal and gas, as well as renewable energy like wind, solar and geothermal. So Solar Alberta conducted a study in early 2020 and concluded that we'll see over 3200 megawatts of solar on Alberta's grid by 2030. Um, but however, reported by the Canadian Energy Regulator, there's already over 2,000 megawatts of solar on the grid as of 2023. So with the Traverse Solar Project came online in 2022, uh, being the largest solar installation in Canada at the time at 465 megawatts. With numbers like those, I expect us to be well over the Solar Alberta study projected in 2020. So my opinion, that's really a good news story. <clears throat> Battery storage will also have a huge uh, part to play as we transform the grid, um, and it's going to be critical if we are looking to have reliable electricity. So over time, we'll see more large-scale um, storage facilities being paired with renewable energy generation plants. These storage facilities also sit in front of the meter because the electricity they dispatch must pass through electric meters at individual properties before it can be used um, for power. So utility scale energy storage is relatively new in relation to Alberta's electricity grid. And here was a story that was published in November of 2022. Um, so this was for the wind charger, Alberta's first scale battery energy storage system owned by independent power producers, TransAlta Renewables. So this facility captures and stores energy generated at 66 megawatts, the Summerview 2 wind farm in Pincher Creek, Alberta. It discharges power to the provincial grid during time of peak demand or low wind conditions. So in doing so, it compensates for the intermittent nature of wind power and makes the grid more reliable. The facility officially began commercial operation in October of 2020 with a nameplate capacity of 10 megawatts and a total energy storage capability of 20 megawatt hours and a two hour charge time. Um, and microgrids. So a little bit more of a complicated type of behind the meter energy system is a microgrid. So microgrids are miniature versions of the larger electric grid that works to power a small number of buildings. So as previously mentioned, uh, they can be connected to larger distribution systems or be completely autonomous. So two great examples of microgrids here in Alberta. So the city of Medicine Hat, which is not actually part of the Alberta interconnected electrical system, they generate their own electricity and their transmission and distribution lines are owned by the city. The city is able to produce enough electricity to satisfy its own electric requirements, which makes them unique in the province of Alberta. Additionally, um, not directly re related to the grid, but I think it's important to showcase how microgrids can support um, communities that are not grid connected. So Fort Chippewan is a remote community located in the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, which is home to about a thousand people. Fort Chippewan are not connected to the grid and have relied on diesel generation for their electricity needs. In 2019, the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, Miccosoo Cree First Nation, and Fort Chippewan Métis Local 125 formed Three Nations Energy to own and operate a 2200 kilowatt PV solar farm that is coupled with an at-code own 400 kilowatt PV solar array and a 1500 kilowatt hour battery storage and microgrid controls, which provides 25% of the community's electrical needs and reduces diesel consumption by 800,000 liters annually. Those most remote communities uh, in Canada are not connected to the North American electricity grid. They are required to make use of their own mini grids. So as with many electric systems, um, to reliably operate a mini grid requires that there is a continuous supply and demand of power to be matched exactly every minute of every day. Mini grids must rely 
on just a few energy sources to achieve this, often with only a single diesel engine. Consistent or non-intermittent sources such as diesel and hydropower can deliver energy reliably. However, intermittent sources such as wind and solar provide a variable output which can complicate grid operations. Therefore, hybrid mini-grids integration will be required in these communities using multiple renewable energy sources as well as reliable backup generation sources in order to help these communities um, on their energy transition journey. Sorry to interrupt, so, Alicia. This is awesome, but we're going to have to transition to Tim. Okay. Soon here, I'm so, so th I've got two slides left, so I'm awesome, so sorry. Awesome. Great. No, appreciate okay. it. It's great content. Um, perfect. So... Yeah, this is how renewables are definitely going to help these communities. Um, lastly, just talking really quickly about community energy, I think there's a real opportunity here um, for citizens to get involved um, in their communities. And we have some great um, examples in Alberta here of, you know, the community of Innisfail that did do their own solar farm. Um, and we also have the Bow Valley Green Energy Cooperative out of Camor that's doing some really awesome things. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, renewables and community energy are going to be um, huge proponents in changing our energy transition here in Alberta. Um, and if you want to get a hold of me, you can contact me through LinkedIn um, and also at acudo at innovatecalgary.com. I'm sorry for taking up so much time. <laughs> No, that was great. Very thorough. Great to, get to cover so much ground. So now we'll just welcome Tim to the screen and get him to share his, and then we'll look forward to chatting with you more during the Q&A, Alicia. Tim, feel free to turn your camera on and share your screen now. Uh, it says the host has not oh. uh, allowed me to turn my video on. That's surprising. Okay. Let's see here. Ask to start video. There we go. Problem. All right, I'm assuming, oh. can you see my screen okay? Looks great, thanks, take it away. Perfect, thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about um, the impact of solar on the Alberta grid. Um, and that is frankly a huge question. <laughs> so I will do my best to sort of speak to more to the area that I spend most of my time on, but but we could spend several days talking about sort of the broader implications of all the things that are going on. Um, so just by very quick way introduction, I appreciate the introduction at the, at the beginning uh, about, about who I am and the work that I do, but uh, just to very quickly touch on some of the research that, uh, that some of my um, research partners and, and uh, grad students are working on is illustrated here, including, looking at things in terms of the evolution of the uh, wind fleet in Alberta, as you can see on the left-hand side, and where we might be thinking about optimizing uh, where we put renewable energy plants or power plants over on the right-hand side from one of our recently graduated um, uh, master students uh, to then looking at the bottom, uh, the impacts of uh, significant amounts of solar growing uh, in the uh, in the overall system. So that's some of the a flavor, a bit of a flavor of some of the work that we do. And I'll be trying to talk a little bit about a little bit more today about uh, some of that that work that the uh, we see in the bottom uh, graphic there. So, as was just uh, wonderfully uh, illustrated uh, before, that that solar really and renewables in general are growing um, very very quickly, uh, and what we're seeing today, the outlook of what we're seeing today is a lot different than we've seen in the past. Uh, and if you were to look over on the right hand side here, this is data from the American uh, Energy Information Agency uh, showing the different types of uh, power plants that have been installed in the United States since 2011, 2000, or sorry, 2019, 20, 2019. Let me just draw on this here. 2019, 2020, and 2021. And they've unfortunately changed the color scheme on us a little bit. But what you can see is that solar has gone from, uh, or is growing very, very quickly. And in fact, in 2021, and I don't have the 2022 data just yet, but obviously it will be out in very short order. Um, solar is actually the single largest source of new electricity in the United States on a, on a measured capacity uh, basis. So it, it's changed a heck of a lot uh, from sort of being, you know, hippies in their backyard doing that, putting on their roofs to just being, you know, big business and, and, and lots of development we're seeing these days. And you might, I mean, I'm sure many of you know this already, but I often, when I'm teaching my uh, energy course, the, one of the first questions I ask the students is, what do you think the most um, lowest cost power is? And what do you think the highest cost power is? And, uh, you know, 
three or four years ago, the answer is sort of universally would be coal is the lowest cost and solar is the highest cost. But uh, you know that's that's radically changed. It's just in the last few years, and you can see that here on the left hand side, where the price of solar. I know there's a lot of data here, and and be ready for some graphs. Um, but <laughs> you see sort of the average price of solar here, and don't worry about the numbers so much. But you can just see the massive decline in prices from sort of 2020 or 2019 to, or 2010, I should say, to 2020, solar has dropped by sort of 85, 90% in, in costs. Uh, and wind has also significantly dropped to the point that now we're in, we're in a world now where wind and solar are straight up economically outcompeting many of their competitors. And that's why in large part, we're seeing solar just take off throughout the world uh, not and and also we're, why we're seeing kind of a, a major change here in Alberta as well. This data just uh, I just uh, uh, pulled from uh, the International Energy Agency this week. This is a report that they published um, not not too long ago. But interestingly, you know that trend that we're seeing in solar, those costs that have come down. There's the expectation is that's going to continue, and there are already some of the lowest cost energy around, and it's only getting cheaper. That solar has gone from basically being a rounding error um, 15 years ago to expected to be the single largest source of installed capacity uh, by the end of this decade. Uh, and in fact, coal has historically, basically since time immemorial, been the single largest source of global electricity generation. Uh, the expectation is by the end of this decade, so by 2030, perhaps even before 2027, the IEA is predicting, um, the output from wind, solar, and, and renewables will actually combined will outstrip coal globally. So we're we're into a new world all of a sudden, uh, and things are just changing, changing really, really rapidly. Uh, and the expectation is that solar is ultimately going to continue to lead to lead that charge. So we have a lot of solar coming into the system. How do we how do we deal with it? Is, is part of the question, I guess. Uh, we know it's we know it's um, it's no longer something that can be ignored and it, ignored, and it's no longer a marginal player. But it's actually it will be the dominant source of electricity uh, in our lifetimes. So it's an incredibly exciting time to be to be looking looking at it and understanding what's going on. In fact. Uh, 2020 was a very interesting, uh, or 2022, I should say, interesting year in Alberta, but the first year that renewables combined and solar is, a, a, again, a relatively small player in this, but a, but, a, but, a, a non, or but an important one. If we take the four major renewables in Alberta, uh, wind, hydro, biomass, and solar, and combine them, 2022 was the year that they actually overtook uh, generation from, from coal. Uh, and so there's still obviously a long way to go, and there's a lot of gas in our system overall, as we can see in this particular graphic. But um, if if we look back just 15 years ago, coal outstripped renewables by uh, a factor of 10 to 1. Uh, and fast forward 15 years later, and renewables have, have overtaken coal, obviously in large part as a result of coal's decline. But the point here, of course, is just that the world is changing on its past, uh, and 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 I think renewables um, often have been perceived as a marginal player and as a high cost player. That whole world—it's a whole different worldview now, and 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 things are things are, are changing on us uh, very very quickly. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, here's a graph uh, from uh, a friend and colleague, uh, Andrew Leach, who he just posted this on Twitter. If you want to. See some great energy graphics in his Twitter feed is an excellent one to follow. But in fact, there's been moments in time where coal has, or solar in Alberta has actually uh, on its own uh, generated more energy than coal. Uh, again, it's small periods of time and only a few hours throughout the day. But the fact that it's happening at all, again, tells us we're, we're into a new world. And in fact, it just happened um, just uh, just last week, uh, January the 24th, in the middle of winter when solar output is uh, significantly lower, that we had this moment in time when when solar was actually uh, generating more than coal. So interesting, interesting times to be to be uh, uh, watching all this stuff unfold. Now the question is, okay, so again, still a relatively small part of our overall system, but but the game is changing on us pretty quickly. So if we look at wind and solar growth in Alberta over the last few years, uh, if we were to much of the graphics that I was showing you before, if we were to go back sort of 10 years, um, solar was a relatively small player and growing. 
in Alberta, it, we only have to go back a few years before, you know, really was kind of a 20, 20, uh, 19 when we saw sort of our first commercial installs uh, of solar, but it's growing very quickly. Solar went from, again, being basically zero uh, from a, uh, a utility scale point of view to about 1% of our electricity system in about three years. So uh, still 1% of the overall system, so relatively small, but again, a three-year time frame. And, and so you you start to imagine, you you draw these lines linearly at your peril in the, if you were to follow that as a uh, exponential uptake, we could see pretty significant uh, growth over the next over the next few years in Alberta, and, and all indications are that's the that's what we're seeing. So, what does this mean? So, I'm going to try to explain a little bit uh, about um, what happens in the electricity market as solar is growing. And so, what we got here, basically, the way our system works is, uh, as was mentioned before, we have this uh, competitive electricity market, and what that means is the different generators are facing off against each other. And so, here is a, a high-level illustration of what's going on in the market, where basically you have power plants that offer in a certain amount of energy that they have available and a price at which they're willing to uh, accept. And the ISO comes along and stacks up all of those uh, offers in order. And then it basically, if we take that uh, demand and we follow here along the x-axis, it just stacks all the way up until we hit whatever the demand is. And the last player in is the one that sets the price. And so if we were to take an example of a 7,500 megawatt demand at a particular moment, we would then have a price for the market of $200 as, as by way of this example. And so this is important to understand because if you look at the way, I've just as an illustrative gra graphic here, but if you look at the way it tends to stack up, we tend to have lower cost technology on the left-hand side, which has limited flexibility. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have higher cost with more flexibility uh, technologies. And so um, when renewables enter the system, then um, you, you can then get a bit of a prediction as to who is going to uh, who's going to be displaced as a result of those renewables coming into the market. So let's very quickly take a look at here some actual data. This is an actual merit order again, um, uh, again a graphic from Andrew Leach, but you can see this is an actual a particular hour in 2018, sort of showing the different. Uh, obviously, our grids changed a lot since then, a lot less coal around, but but you can kind of see the way it stacks up. A lot of sort of zero offers down here, and then. Um, increasing prices uh, upwards to the right. And so at any given time, the price will settle then again at whatever the demand happens to be at that particular that particular hour. So what's important to imagine or what's important to understand though, is when we add renewables into the system and wind, I've got wind in this particular graphic just because it's a bit older when there was more wind, uh, or, uh, well, there still is more wind, but when wind is what we were talking about more often, but you can imagine this being wind or solar, we can put solar down here. When they come into the market, they have no fuel cost. Uh, and so they're also going to offer their power in at $0 per megawatt hour. And so if we take the exact same graphic we saw a moment ago, and now we're going to add in 1,000 megawatts of wind or solar, what's going to happen to the exact same order, which we, we put our power plants in, the whole thing kind of moves over to the right-hand side uh, as a result of this solar entering the grid. So if we take that exact same system we had a moment ago, and we had a 7,500 megawatt demand, our price, which a moment ago was $200 per megawatt hour, in this particular example, might drop down to something like $20. Now that's just an illustration, but you, you can see then as, you, as you're adding renewables into the system, because they're coming into the market at zero, because they have no incremental fuel cost, once you built it, it's any incremental energy is in, in essence free um, or no fuel cost at the very least. Uh, so because they're coming into the market at zero, they're always pushing the market price down. So anytime you get more renewables in the system, you have this price depressing effect. So that's good. it's worthwhile to understand that because it, you sort of understand how the electricity market works, but also understanding that there's a give and take, that if something is coming into the market, something else is getting pushed out. And so when wind or solar uh, are coming into the market, they're coming in again and, and pushing out a higher cost and typically a higher polluting uh, source of energy. So if we take some corollaries of that, then let's let's ignore what I just said a moment ago about uh, about where wind and solar are, are, are how what how they're impacting the market. But let's look just sort of more broadly at the market itself. And you can take basically you take that that hour that that we'll call the merit order. 
you take it any given hour uh, and where it settles is, is the price for that particular hour. And so what's going to happen then, and you can look at this data in all sorts of different ways, and I've got some illustrations of that here in the top left hand, or sorry, sorry the top right hand side, you can see that's the um, hourly prices since 2014, and you can see it moves all over the place. And typically we have sort of an average price, oops, uh, the average price is somewhere uh, down here. Uh, but then you see a lot of these spikes and really, really high prices. And those spikes don't happen that often. They're happening more these days than they used to. Uh, but um, um, but they can have a, a pretty significant overall impact on the, on the overall cost of the system uh, or the overall cost that, that, that uh, our electricity um, price works out to. Um, we don't pay as average consumers. We don't pay that spot market price. We end up paying an average, uh, an average sort of monthly um, a, a aggregation of, of those uh, individual spot prices. In, large industry does pay those those spot prices. But anyway, you can kind of see you can see that those uh, individual spikes are are important in terms of what the overall average price is, is going to be. Uh, and then on the bottom left hand side, you can see um, um, monthly average prices. And unfortunately, we're in a situation right now where prices have been going up. Um, but the the point here is at least you can sort of understand where um, where these prices are all coming from. So what happens then, of course, is you see those spikes when a couple of things are occurring. You typically see them during peak times or high demand times, as well as uh, potentially low supply uh, availability. You can also see if I were to take those prices and average them out on a 24-hour a, a basis, you can see on the left-hand side here the prices. So here is 2022. Our price looks something like this. Maybe I should illustrate that and highlight that in yellow. So there's our... Our prices and on the right hand side you can see demand and you can see there's a, obviously a bit of a correlation between those two and the high priced hours the highest price hours occur when the demand uh, is is highest okay so what does that all mean then for solar uh, and so having said what we said a moment ago about lots of solar is coming into the system and um uh, and now knowing a little bit what we know about uh, about the overall market having more solar in the system is going to mean there's more supply in the system and so it's going to be have an average lowering of market prices and bring uh, electricity prices down when it when it's generating at the same time when solar is coming into the system it's pushing something else out of the system and that tends to be your high your most expensive and in many cases your most polluting uh, or your highest emitting uh, sources of electricity now I should mention, of course, that, that many of you folks might be are probably interested in sort of distributed energy or on your roof uh, systems, and th they're not operating in the market in the in the same way where you're not that power is not being offered into the market in, in the same way. But really, what's happening is when your solar is on, it's dropping your demand at, at that. It means it's a, it's a sort of a negative load, or uh, your demand is concurrently dropping. So in in effect, it's having the exact same impact on the system. You're essentially lowering lowering that demand. Um, now, another important thing to know for for um, for retailers or, or sorry for uh, for residential customers is that you get paid or you pay your bill on a monthly average basis, but the electricity that you're selling tends to occur at the higher priced hours, and so you tend to actually be selling power into the market when prices are actually higher, whereas you're being compensated at the average uh, at an closer to an average price. So if you were to look at then, let's look at 2021 and 2022, we've had a lot of uh, solar on the system. You can see that the average price uh, in the market was about $100, whereas when solar was generating, it was almost 40% higher. So there's, in, in essence, if you're getting paid the average price, uh, the market was sort of benefiting uh, because the price happened to be, was actually much higher at that particular moment. So you're, you're in some ways, you're actually subsidizing uh, the, overall, the overall system. Now, so that might be good. So that's good news in some ways that solar is showing up uh, in many cases when we want it. It's showing up when prices are high, uh, and it's obviously uh, displacing some of our higher emitting uh, sources. The knife does cut both ways, of course, though. And so if we look at California, uh, famously, if you start to add more and more solar onto the system, so let's take, I'm going to go back here, let's look at this particular graphic, and you'll notice. This is actual data. So this is actual solar generation on the right hand side and actual average demand. But my scales are very, very different on the left and the right hand side. 
Um, and I've just done that so you can illustrate, you can kind of see so when solar is generating relative to uh, to the demand, but solar is obviously the, the number here on the on the on this axis here on the right hand side is, is much smaller. But we've seen that exponential curve, right? So that's going to grow significantly and, and very likely to, to grow uh, could be a lot more in, in the near future. And so if we were to take the basically this blue curve and subtract this yellow curve here, we would end up with something that might look like that. And if you sort of imagine sort of a negative, a negative less demand as a result of solar beam. And, and that's all fine. So more or less the same thing happens. But then I add a lot more solar onto the or I add more solar next year and I add more solar next year and I add more solar after that. You start to have a pretty you can you can go from sort of a marginal impact to a very significant uh, a very significant impact. And we start to draw this shape which we affectionately call uh, the duck curve. And it so it sort of looks like a bit of a duck here. I know that's a bit hard to see, but it looks like a bit of a duck. Uh, and, and what happened now is that solar was generating at the highest priced hours. It actually ends up that solar starts to generate at the lowest price hours because you start to get more and more and more and more of these zero offers into the market, uh, continually uh, pushing prices down. And so here, I'd, uh, coming back then, if we look at Cal California is kind of the jurisdiction that first noticed this in, in a big way that you start to see as more and more solar got into the system that you start to see a pretty pronounced duck, uh, a duck curve or duck shape uh, occurring. California is obviously not the only one that's dealing with that. If we look at Australia, Southern Australia, lots of solar on the grid. So you've got your utility scale, uh, actually residential scale, which is even larger in Southern Australia and utility scale there. You can, have a, you can have moments in time where you have only solar on the system. And if we said a moment ago, solar in the market at zero, basically the market price can drop right down to zero at that particular moment in time, which is great from a consumer point of view. But maybe not so great if you're the owner of that solar plant and suddenly you were expecting to see higher prices and and suddenly um, your market prices dropped uh, dropped to zero. So that's one of the pretty interesting questions that people are studying and trying to understand uh, how to deal with that. Uh, we look over in the top. You can see this actual data from uh, from California, who are also you know uh, dealing with this reality, and and you can start to see batteries are starting to come into the system. So you're charging your batteries here overnight or sorry, uh, not overnight, but you're charging your batteries when you have excess solar in the system and then selling it on, on the margins or when the sun sets. And so that's a, that's a pretty interesting opportunity for, for storage as it starts to, as we start to get more and more renewables on the system, you start to create that space for, uh, for, for batteries. Now, a little bit of bad news. Uh, I don't want to end necessarily on a negative note, but one of the challenges in a Northern climate like Alberta's is that Unfortunately for us, uh, as we know that our days are pretty short in the winter uh, and uh, our peak in our overall system tends to occur uh, around 6 p.m. or so in the winter months, uh, often in some of our some of our, our shorter days uh, at a time. So solar on average produces when we when demand is higher and, and consumption is higher, but it tends to miss the the actual peak itself. Uh, and it not only misses it in the sense that the sun is setting, but it also we just have less energy available to us if we kind of look at the relative size of the the, 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 the winter versus the summer. So that's a bit of, that can be a, a bit of a challenge. It gets exasperated a bit more in the fact that a couple of the really important technologies that we're going to imagine in the near future, electric vehicles and heat pumps, which were discussed a moment ago, also tend to be uh, higher loads in the winter, in, in the winter uh, as well as overnight. So uh, a bit out of sync with uh, when solar is available to us, uh, potentially exacerbating uh, exacerbating this problem. Now the good news is that uh, um, that you can pair wind with solar, or wind with hydro, or solar with hydro, and obviously batteries are coming onto the system. Uh, and so there are ways to to solve uh, some of these problems, but uh, it's always cheaper to try to. Use it's always cheaper to use the energy the moment that it's available. Uh, and so this is a, a bit of an inherent challenge, uh, a, a bit of a, a, an irony in some ways that as you get, and this isn't just solar that this happens to, it happens to wind as, as well, but as you get more and more of these low cost renewables onto the system, they start to push their own market price down further and further and further. And so they're sort of continually forcing uh, their own 
uh, driving their own costs, uh, co not only prices, but also arguably their, their own costs down in order to remain competitive. So the good news for people like myself uh, is that there's lots of work to do. We're seeing lots of uh, solar. Uh, we don't expect to see it slow down anytime soon. Uh, and there's just simply going to be lots of lots of work to do. Um, if we take data from a year ago, and I know this is a lot's changed in solar in the last year, but if we just uh, hypothetically take uh, actual wind and solar data from a year ago, and we were to scale it up and just basically take wind data, multiply it by five, and take solar data, multiply it by 20, you get the graph that we see here uh, on the right-hand side. And the, one of the other challenges that we see is you see variability in that output. Um, obviously, it's so solar not generating at night, and wind can have pretty significant ups and downs too. So there's potentially you might see that as a uh, as a, a challenge or potentially an opportunity. Again, it sort of opens up that opportunity for buying and selling, whether that's import or export to British Columbia or Montana or somewhere else, or potentially driving the market for, for energy storage. But it's also a, a potentially a significant challenge where you end up with two or three days if it's not a whole lot of wind and cloudy. How do you make sure that our system can survive through those those cold days. Not to say it can't be done, but it's obviously a challenge that needs to be needs to be thought through and, and overcome. So that's there's lots of work that's going on in that area. And it's really sort of one of the major issues and challenges that people are working on all throughout North America. So the good news is there's lots of work to do. Um, not all are we seeing not not only do we expect to see lots of work in the actual industry itself, but there's lots of work in how we integrate uh, how we integrate the system and how we kind of move towards that renewable energy future as costs continue uh, continue to decline. So I realized that was just a very quick overview of one area of the of the system, but when you're thinking about solar and what it's doing on the system, it's important to understand how it's interacting with all of its other neighbors and, and what some of those benefits uh, and, and challenges occur as a result. So thanks very much for your attention. I'm happy to have questions when we move into our next phase of the discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Alicia. Alicia, if you wouldn't mind turning your camera back on, hopefully you're enabled to do that. And this was great. I should have known putting two professors in the same presentation, we might have had a few time issues. So I really appreciate the detail though. And I think our whole audience does because they're sticking with us to the very end. Uh, usually we see a, a drop off right at the hour, but not today. So it uh, looks like everybody's very engaged. We do have a number of questions in the q and I see a few folks putting their hands up. We're going to have the opportunity to raise our hands during the Zoom meeting room soon. But if you have a question for this formal part of the webinar, please do actually type it into the Q&A. And uh, we'll also be using the upvote feature for that. So let's dive into some of these questions here uh, with our remaining time. So we have a question about solar clubs. Um, how do solar clubs make money by having you as a solar export customer? Solar clubs are popular and help pay off solar costs, but I don't understand how they work. Um, I know I've sat through a couple webinars on that, so I could take a stab at it, but I want to open it up to the two of you first in case you'd like to touch on that uh, question. I say go ahead, Heather, and we'll uh, pop in if there's anything to add. Yeah, absolutely. And I will refer folks to our YouTube channel where we do have a webinar about the Solar Club. You can find it there. Essentially, Solar Club allows those little folks who are generating solar on their home or business to act a little bit like a power plant in that they are allowed to change their prices a little bit. So they can't change it by the minute like a power plant can, but they can change it seasonally. And so in the spring, uh, you're able to actually increase the price that you are getting for your solar and paying for your electricity. And then in the fall, you can switch back to lower the price that you're getting for your electricity um, and, uh, and also paying for your electricity. So you, you, you basically price switch twice a year if you're in a solar club. And uh, it's a really nice opportunity to pay your system back quicker. And what it I, I mean, I can't speak exactly to how this solar club folks make money, but I assume they're taking a small cut from the profits. Um, usually, <laughs> usually anytime someone's offering a service whereby you make a bit of money, uh, they're getting a small cut off the side. So, um, so yeah, but uh, hopefully we can learn more about the solar club uh, through our other, our other webinars and uh, touch more on your presentations today. Uh, yeah, Justin, if, if I can just maybe yeah, sure. add very briefly to that, I, I think that, that uh, in, in some ways that sort of recognizes the fact that the solar 
energy is actually more valuable uh, than the average pool price. And so there is uh, there is some rationale to it. Uh, at the same time, when we start imagining everybody with a solar module on their roof, um, we end up in a, a, bit, a, bit, a bit of a different world uh, as well. And there's lots of jurisdictions that are that are wrestling with that. And so I do see the solar club as an important thing or the, that, that uh, micro generation regulation as important enabling regulation. Mm -hmm. um, but I would imagine it as a, something that has a time limit on it as well, that I imagine it's sort of 10 or 15 or 20 years from now as we imagine lots more solar on the system. Uh, I, I have to imagine the rules will probably change on us at some point. They, they may change. <laughs> they may change, and I suspect maybe when they change, they should they should change uh, to allow for solar the value of solar to be reflected in other ways, like the net metering, for example, that Alicia mentioned earlier. Um, we we can recognize the value in a variety of ways. But as as Gordon Howell likes to remind us, who uh, is on is on the line today, welcome Gordon. Uh, there's nothing in the microgeneration regulation currently that says you can't make any money. Uh, so we appreciate that about the regulation, and we actually do have a whole webinar about the regulation as well on our YouTube channel. So if folks are really want to nerd out on the microgen regs with the AUC, uh, feel free to check that out. So that's a great great point, though, Tim. Justin says, what is the impact at a neighborhood level? If too many houses in a neighborhood have solar and during the day are exporting more than the demand of the neighborhood, how is that managed? I have heard this causes local transformers to fail and there will need to be a significant province-wide infrastructure upgrade of these transformers. Are the distribution companies such as FCOR and NMAX on track to upgrade at the same rate of increased solar production or solar adop adoption? I'll touch on that briefly and then I'm going to turn the mic over to you too. Uh, at last year's solar show, we did have the wire providers attend. So you can actually hear from EPCOR and Max Fortis and ATCO uh, for, about this type of topic. It's on our YouTube channel. And I will say that they are kind of ready to go, ready to give her. So if, if we want more, they're, they're, the, the message I heard last year was, they're ready to start scaling things up for us. So that was the general message, but I think there's more to this question. So Tim and Alicia, would one of you want to elaborate here on that topic? Well, this I, goes back to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just saying, this goes back to the planning. So um, the, uh, these are considerations that are taken into, I'm sure, great care. Um, through you know the the ASOs planning of transmission and as we get into distribution and the reason why applications need to be made and you can't just you know take it upon yourself to just go and throw a solar system up on your home there, there's these checks and balances put in for a reason um, and I'm sure we'll see more of this planning needs to be taken into consideration as more things get electrified and more of us take on electric vehicles and, and those types of things as well go ahead Tim yeah, I was, I, that's a great point, and um, I think um, there's some, there's obviously some truth to, or not some, there is a lot of truth <laughs> to that, that our system was not designed with this in mind, right? It was designed as a one-way delivery system, and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't thought about in terms of uh, ultimately going in the, in the other direction, and so we are going to need to upgrade a lot of our infrastructure, but it's not just solar that's going to drive that upgrade requirement it's going to be electric vehicles it's probably going to be heat pumps it's probably going to be air conditioning frankly um and and the system just simply needs to be is going to need to be upgraded uh, because it's 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 an outdated system frankly uh for what the modern world is going to demand in the same way that we build new roads or we build new infrastructure when that's what demands and that's what we do one of the nice things though is that we know this is not impossible to do i mean we have examples of a place like Quebec, for example, that does basically most houses use electric heating. And so their system is, you know, their system needs much less changing than, than a system like Alberta's might. And we can kind of look there as a, uh, by way of a, a example that this is not something our utilities can't do. And the other nice thing to think about is that, yes, there's going to be costs involved, but we tend to recover those costs uh, as, as a portion of our consumption. And frankly, as consumption goes up, when we think about whether it's uh, um, electric vehicles or heat pumps or whatever the like, it helps to spread some of those costs around a little bit. So on a per kilowatt hour basis, the, that cost maybe not might, might not be as drastic as it might think in spite of the upgrades that it requires. 
Yeah, and there are certainly conversations going on right now about where, whether all new developments should be going in with 200 amp service. And that is something that the AUC is collecting feedback on right now. And Max has already started rolling that out uh, without AUC um, decisions. EPCOR is waiting on the AUC. Uh, so we're really advocating for that. Uh, but at the same time, we are offering a session at the Solar Show next week about optimized electrification and all of the various techniques you can use if you have an infill um, home or if you're retrofitting your home to avoid actually having a service upgrade because there are some pretty cool new technologies to help with that. Um, so kind of a two pronged approach. <laughs> yes, let's let's expand the infrastructure, but also let's make sure we're developing products that hopefully uh, help us balance that that demand. Um, we'll take, I think, one more question here in the webinar, and then we'll switch over to our Zoom uh, meeting room. So I just want to encourage anyone who doesn't get their question answered here to join us in the Zoom meeting room after, and you can ask it there personally to our lovely presenters today. So question is, is it correct to say that commercial grade wind solar without storage is actually potentially detrimental to long term grid stability as investors will see little incentive to upgrade um, add uh, natural gas based low generation due to solar and wind pulling down prices and profits for every FF fossil fuel, I'm going to assume, and RE, renewable energy generator, uh, thus large scale energy storage is becoming absolutely critical. I'll comment quickly and then I'll turn it to you. I was in a presentation with a utility scale wind producer recently. He said they don't do any product, uh, they don't do any farms these days without co combining it with energy storage. That is becoming the norm in the wind industry. Maybe you folks could comment on solar specifically though and this question here. I personally think storage is going to be a, cr a critical component of not both the energy transition, but also the energy transformation. And like, um, you know, Tim had mentioned as things become more and more electrified um, and that intermittency and that stability and the reliability, that's going to be a critical component of, of the new grid. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that, Tim? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I think we'll see more and more storage on the system or, and also you know, like any good system, diversity is going to be part of the key, right? And so having uh, like, like a good stock portfolio, you're going to have some different types of different technologies, but also technologies in different parts of uh, of the province as well. So you might have, you know, it's windier in one part of the province or frankly windier in your neighboring province, the ability to kind of push and pull power and sort of take advantage of that. So we are, frankly, we are going to have to rethink our system, right? And, um, but, uh, but our current system arguably is, is out of date and it's, it's kind of the equivalent of dirt road uh, system. And we, you know, we didn't, just because we needed to upgrade the roads, we didn't sort of say, wow, these dirt roads are good enough. You know, we, it's time to, it's time to upgrade them and, yeah. and kind of get where the, the, the world is going, get where the system is going. Yeah, definitely. I'm glad you mentioned the regional component because we don't need to operate as an island. I mean, we we could, we can build those interties. It is possible. There are people pushing for the federal government and others to to build regional connections so that we can draw on each other's um, diverse energy uh, supplies. So you know, hopefully, we'll have a little bit of that with a lot of battery storage and uh, with that combination, deal with the uh, intermittent intermittency issues. So. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to say though. I I, I keep thinking, um, uh, would we ever get along well enough to get those uh, <laughs> inter ties? I I'm not sure. It seems like everyone just wants to fight. Where where energy storage is great that way. You can do it. You don't have to wait for everybody else to sign on. <laughs> so in terms of uh, in terms of uh, what's politically feasible, energy storage is very politically feasible. Um, but I do think it'll have to be a combo, and we'll we'll have to work together across the region to actually uh, address this as well. Can't yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a great question because it really is kind of the state of the debate. This is what people are talking about and Absolutely. trying to figure out. And it's not, I don't mean to suggest that this is all easy and, and roses and without costs. And but this is this is what people are discussing and, and yeah. trying to figure out right now. So. And we can, we can do it. I mean, we've done big infrastructure projects before. So, you know, it's not, we haven't in a while, but it's not the first to, for Canada to to take on big infrastructure projects. Well, that's awesome. These questions are phenomenal. And I hate uh, that we can't ask all of these questions today.